1865. With the Union advances of the previous year, it is only short months until the end of the war. For the last two years, Abraham Lincoln has called for an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that will build upon the Emancipation Proclamation and bring all slavery to an end. Passed by the Senate in April 1864, it is now, nearly a year later, passed by the House of Representatives on January 31. Lincoln heartily approves, and the resolution is ready for submission to the states for ratification. On March 4, President Lincoln takes the oath of office for his second term. His second inaugural address calls for the end of war and the healing of the nation. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue, until all the wealth piled by the bondman's two hundred and fifty years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said three thousand years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, with malice toward none with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. The Adventists mark the second inauguration of President Lincoln in their own way. James White, John Loughborough, and the other officers of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists call for a four-day period of fasting and prayer. And so in the review, our administrators called on the Adventists to engage in a series of days of fasting and prayer. They would pray earnestly that God would cause the war to come to an end. And our people really engaged earnestly in that. They took it very seriously. So they were praying that this, this cruel war would come to a speedy termination. A terrible rebellion has been raging in this land for now nearly four years. The mind of the nation is so absorbed in this dreadful contest that it is almost impossible to call attention to religious subjects. The war must stop, or our work in spreading the truth must stop. We earnestly request all our churches and scattered brethren to set apart four days, commencing Wednesday, March 1st, and continuing till the close of the following Sabbath, as days of earnest prayer over this subject. Events begin moving with startling rapidity. During the first three days of April, the 10-month siege of Petersburg, Virginia, is finally broken. On April 4, President Lincoln and his young son Tad walk the streets of the fallen Confederate capital of Richmond, surrounded by cheering crowds of freed slaves. J.J. Hill, a black soldier from Connecticut, recalls, He proceeded to the rebel capital and from the steps delivered a short speech and spoke to the colored people as follows. God has made you free. Although you have been deprived of your God-given rights by your so-called masters, you are now as free as I am, for God created all men free, given to each the same rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The gratitude and admiration with which the colored people of Richmond received the president must have deeply touched his heart he came among the poor unheralded, without pomp or pride, and walked through the streets as if he were a private citizen. He came not with bitterness in his heart, but with the olive leaf of kindness, a friend to alleviate sorrow and suffering, and to rebuild what had been destroyed. On April 9, 
the final confrontation between the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia and the Union Army of the Potomac takes place. At Appomattox Courthouse, General Robert E. Lee surrenders to Union General Ulysses S. Grant. Most of the remaining Confederate forces will shortly surrender as well. And the long war finally comes to an end. So suddenly was the terminus of the war affected that the public journals gave credit to the Lord for the closing of the war. Even E.M. Stanton, Secretary of War, began his letter of congratulations to Grant in response to the news of the victory with the words, Thanks be to Almighty God. So did the Seventh-day Adventists and rejoiced that the strife had ceased. John Loughborough. And I think this was the spirit of the Adventists too. I think that they felt that, that God had heard their earnest intercessions and in fasting and prayer um, for this war to come to a speedy end. And indeed it did. While the loyal North is rejoicing in the downfall of Richmond, the successes of the Union, and the apparent nearness of the complete overthrow of the rebellion and the consequent peace, none have more reason to rejoice than the commandment-keeping people of God. They see not only the immediate effects that others see, the cessation of slaughter and bloodshed, but they see a fulfillment of prophecy, an answer to prayer. We therefore thank God for the visible manifestation of His hand in our national affairs. But the war will not end without one last great shock to the nation. On April 14, Good Friday, President Abraham Lincoln visits Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Mary. John Wilkes Booth, a famous actor and Southern sympathizer, enters the presidential box and shoots President Lincoln in the back of the head at point-blank range. Lincoln dies at 7.22 the next morning. I think that the death of Abraham Lincoln hit Avenus like Americans generally. You know, it was a shock. Uh, I think Adventists sorrowed over the losses and rejoiced over the peace and grieved over the tragedy of Lincoln's assassination and they, they weren't out, out of touch with American experience. They were living in it and share, it was for them uh, also a, a great loss. The air rang with shouts. Richmond is taken and Lee has surrendered. Bonfires and rockets streamed up to the heavens while cheers rang again. But God's loyal people were on their knees, blessing heaven for the answer of their prayers and weeping with joy over the faithfulness of God in fulfilling his word. But at the very hour when the North was drunken with joy over victories that made every loyal heart glad, the assassin was aiming the deadly shot at the brain of the president. Terrible news flashed over all the wires of the land, and a nation wild with joy is at once in tears and draped in mourning. James White The United States has weathered a great storm. Slaves are free. Union is preserved. But the cost of war is high. No wonder many of the theologians and preachers in the aftermath of the war said that the war was a kind of redemption for America. It was a redemption by blood. The Seventh-day Adventists have also passed through a great storm. The church is organized. Believers have maintained their moral stand in the face of war. They have faced personal tragedy and stood firm for their faith. Well, the church, I, I, I really think, had growing pains because the Civil War tested everybody. So it's extremely important, I think, that we link the Civil War with church organization. Eventually, we would have done it, but it would have taken a, a longer time period because there was this strong, you know, anti-establishmentarian feeling, this organization is Babylon feeling in the church. Now we're forced to do it. 
and God is interested in what's happening. It's not just uh, something going on with, with humans and governments and, and states and peoples. There's a bigger issue going on. And for Seventh-day Adventists, that heavenly view becomes uh, the most important part of the view. I think one of the great lessons is that the, the faith cannot be dependent on the politics. I can influence politics, hopefully. That's the way it should go. I cannot let the, my, the politics influence my faith. God has this nation in His hands. I think that that gave them a sense of peace about it. Even though the war was distracting, it was very difficult for all Americans during that time, it gave them a sense of hope that they would get through this experience. Therefore, they didn't have to be obsessed with what's going to happen with the next battle. They could leave it in the Lord's hands. This nation was in His hands. These men and women were willing to lay out their treasure, their, their earthly resources for the gospel. These men and women truly believed that this was God's work. There, there is no hint of personal aggrandizement or personal wealth to be acquired by what they were doing. They had that strong will to work hard, to save, to accomplish. They were frugal. They were industrious. They were able to continue and persevere in spite of obstacles. They cared about their neighbors. There, there was a sense of community. Um, I think they cared about their nation. I, I believe that they were patriotic. And it's particularly important now as the church is growing worldwide, what they started is this, an ongoing process and will continue on what the pioneers started will continue on until the Lord comes. And if we stop, we will lose our identity. We should not have made it through this. We should not have made it through this. It's too complex um, to have actually survived, but we did. No. If, you're, if you're looking at divine intervention, you might say that's the point right there. It's one of those points where you can't really nail it down, but there is something to be said. Maybe there is something in that point. Um, a uh, salvation that we didn't earn. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists look to the future. Peace now does not mean repose or security. It means activity in working for God and His cause. It means a little time in which to spread the truth and prepare as many as possible. Are we ready for the opportunities that Providence is about to put in our hand?